Uh, if I say nothing else and you hear, you hear, as you hear the words from me, I want to make sure that you understand that God loves you. If you hear nothing else from me, I need to communicate this, that God loves you. And he loves you so much that he sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for your sins and mine. All right, so let's just keep that in the forefront of our minds. God, in his sovereign wisdom, has ordained two hot places. Let us pray. Father, we're so grateful to you because you are sovereign. You're full of wisdom. So God, as I attempt to preach this morning about your two hot places, I pray, Father God, that you would just use me for your honor and your glory. You'll be lifted up, you'll be glorified. I'll be put low as I need to be. Because Father God, nothing matters but the exaltation of your name. Be glorified now as we partake of your living word. In Jesus' name, amen. God in his sovereign wisdom has ordained two hot places. Uh, the first you might know all too well. Matthew 25 verse 41 tells us that the first hot place is a place called hell. It wasn't prepared for you and I, it was actually prepared for the devil who in his pride sinned against God. Hell is dark, it's eternal, and yes, it's hot because it blazes with fire. And I want to note the fact that it's eternal. I want to say to you, it's not like a hot flash. I get a hot flash every now and then, not often, but every now and then. And I do understand there's nothing that I can do to alleviate that hot flash but to wait and let it go by. But praise God, when it goes by, I feel a sense of relief. But you won't get that same scenario in hell. Hell is not meant for us, but hell was meant for the devil and for all of those who never come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. One way that I saw it put, and I thought it was so interesting, I had to write it down, is that they call hell God's garbage dump. As you go through the book of Revelations, you'll see terminologies like Gehenna, which in many cases translates out to hell. Over 12 times it's used. And I want to say to you, those whose names is not in the Lamb's book of life, you are destined for hell. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 4 says this, if God spared not the angels when they sinned, then you know, and this is me paraphrasing this latter part, you know if he didn't spare the angels, then you know there's no hope for us other than Christ Jesus. We will suffer the same fate if we do not turn to God. So I encourage you, turn to God by asking him for forgiveness of your sins and believing that Jesus died and rose again so that you will be in heaven with him and escape hell. So God's first hot place is hell. And I'm willing to bet you don't know where the second hot place is ought to be. No, it's not Jamaica. <laughs> no, it's not Trinidad and Tobago. And it's certainly not England. Talking to some family members, they say, Roger, when are you coming to England? I said, well, when, is it, when should I come? When is it going to be 86 and hot and sunny? They said, well, you're not coming to England. <laughs> I said, you're probably right. Because I like the vacation when it's hot. Any guess on where God's second hot place should be or is? Let me help you out. 
God's second hot place may not be where you expect it, but God wants this next place to be hot as hell. And that is us, the church. Don't throw me out yet. Let me just try to give it to you so you understand where I'm coming from. We was read Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 to 16. And I want to say to you in Revelation chapter 1, John has a vision of, of Jesus Christ and his return. And then in chapter 4, there's a vision of God in heaven. And then we have the, the throngs of people gathered around his throne to worship him. But nestled between chapter 1 and chapter 4, there's chapters 2 and there's chapters 3. And in the midst of those two chapters, there's a couple of letters that John wrote to the churches of Asia. And I want to submit to you that these churches are not what I want this church to be. The letters were filled with commendation in some, but in other ways, also a rebuke. Laodicea was a wealthy, it was probably the wealthiest of these seven churches, with its black wool and its medicine for the eyes. But I want you to know that water was pumped into Laodicea. And as the water was pumped in, the water would come, sometimes come from the hot springs, and when the hot springs were being pumped into Laodicea, by the time it got to the Laodicea, it was lukewarm. And there was another um, commentary that I read that said it was cold water being pumped in. And nonetheless, cold water being pumped in, once it left its first destination, it was cold, but once it got to Laodicea, it was lukewarm. And you can break down the lukewarm terminology you want, but that's not my focus here this morning. My focus here when I was doing some studying is on the word hot. And I'll have you know that in the Greek, the word hot means hot. Yeah, I had to chuckle myself when I looked it up. I'm like, okay. But God's second hot place should be the church. And I know some will probably say, well, listen, Brother Roger, he's talking about the church, the, the, the universal church, if you will, or, or the building, in fact. But I want to submit to you, and I'm willing to argue the point, that the church is made up of individuals. And as individuals, we are the church. And I want to share with you just three things, and I'm going to be out your way quickly. The what, the why, and the how. What does it mean to be a church? Or what does it mean to be a hot church? Or what does a hot church look like? So just take a tour with me, if you will. Let's turn over to Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. And this gives us a little indication of what a hot church looks like. And you don't have to say amen. You don't have to do anything. If this is... If, if this is something that's missing in this scenario that doesn't fit you, let's, let's, let's hope and we're going to trust in the Lord that's going to fit you in the future. Because we know that our Christian walk is a transformation process. And I want to say this to you, saints. It's such a joy to go through this Christian walk with you all. No telling what tomorrow may hold. But isn't it a joy just to know that we're walking through this thing? Only God knows the future. Verse 9 in Romans chapter 12. Joe, don't, don't just pretend to love others, really love them. And I'm not going to just, well, you know what, let me just read it through because I think it's important. Hate what is wrong, hold tightly to what is good, love each other with genuine affection, and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our, in our confident hope, be patient in trouble, and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, 
be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. How's that going? Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, okay. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them, but pray that God will bless the person who's persecuting me. God's ways are not our ways. Verse 15, be happy with those who are happy. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. How's that going? Don't be too proud. How's that going? Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. Yeah, that's, you could stay an amen right there. You run into some folks like that every now and then. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Now, all of this, when you read all of this, I'm saying to myself, like, wow, that's a lot. And I'm pretty sure and I'm pretty confident that all of us can probably say, you know what, we're lacking in one or two or three or four of these areas. Some of us just one, right? But I want to say to you this. I want to just cast your attention on verses. Let me start with verse 9. Don't just pretend to love others, really love them. The word love there translates out to agape. When you look at verse 10, love each other with a genuine affection, that's that phileo, Philadelphia love. But look at verse 9 again. Don't just pretend to love others, really love them. I once heard someone say that when you're ministering, sometimes you shouldn't get all entangled in the drama of the person you're ministering to. I don't know if that's biblical. The Bible says here, really love them. Agape love is sacrificial love. So sometimes you do get entangled with the drama of the next person. All in the hopes of what? Bringing them out of that junk that they're in so they get to know Christ Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But that's an agape type of love. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. And this is the part I want to focus in on, verse 11. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Now, if you were, you know, I was uh, breaking a bread this morning. It was encouraging. Uh, for one, uh, Brother Henry preached my sermon. So if you were here, this is probably second number two of what you're getting. But I want to say to you, saints, that Let's, let, me, let, me, let me just try to break this down for you instead of me trying to um, talk off the top of my head here. So what does it mean to be a hot church? Romans 12, 9 and 12 is telling us what's going on. But verse 11, the word enthusiastically here is the same Greek word used for when the water is being brought to a boil. And if I can break down the verse 11 just a different way to hopefully to help you to understand, it says this. Show an example in zeal as a slave to the Lord. What am I saying? In other words, show that the gospel has transformed you as you passionately share what Jesus has done for you with the hopes that these the folks that you're ministering to will come to know the gospel, will come to know the God of the gospel. 
And what was so nice is that God has even given us an example. If you look at Acts chapter 18, I, I enjoyed this because as you know, as you break down the Bible, as you read and you're trying to say, listen, all I was focusing on was the word hot. And as I'm focusing on the word hot, it takes me to different places in the Bible. So if I jump around a little bit, you understand why. And sometimes the Bible in, a, in and of itself um, you try to understand it, so sometimes the Bible doesn't per se line it out for you. But as we research and as we seek to understand, sometimes it says, hey, listen, you need to go over to a different passage in order to understand what's being said. So if you turn with me to Acts chapter 18, verses 24 to 28. Right, because I'm talking about being a hot church here. So this gives us a good example of being a hot church. Now, I want to say this, and I'm going to kind of jump around a little bit. Sometimes we can get churchy. Sometimes it's kind of like a, a religious exercise. But I want to submit to you that the church has to be more than that. Look at verse 18, excuse me, chapter 18 in Acts uh, 24, verse 24, are you there? Me meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, an eloquent speaker who knew the scripture well, had arrived in Ephesus from Alexandria in Egypt. He had been taught the way of the Lord, and he taught others about Jesus with an enthusiastic spirit and with an accuracy. However, he knew only about John's baptism. Let me just submit to you, Apollos didn't get it all. Not at, that, not at this particular point in time. But I want you to note that here, guess this, look at this. Eloquent speaker. He knew the scriptures well. But was wrong. He didn't get it all. You ever been in school? And you get one of those kids next to you in class and the teacher asks a question and they, oh, I know the answer, I know the answer. And they yell out the answer without, before being called upon. Some of the teachers know what I'm talking about. And those kids are loud and wrong. Apollos was loud and wrong for a good while. Well, when Priscilla and Aquila heard him preaching boldly in the synagogue, Again, we're talking about a hot church here, saints. Look at this gentleman. He was off point, but he was doing it what? Boldly. Then Priscilla and Aquila heard him in preaching boldly in the synagogue. They took him aside and explained the way of God even more accurately. So you think he was hot before? Read on. Apollos had been thinking about going to uh, Asia and the, and the brothers and sisters in Ephesus encouraged him to go. They wrote to the believers in Asia, asking them to welcome him. When he arrived, he proved to be great benefit to those who by God's grace had believed. So he was edifying the saints, amen, right? But he refuted the Jews with the powerful arguments in public debate, using the scriptures and explained to them that Jesus was the Messiah. I'm all for education. I'm all for education. I know a lot of you are a lot more educated than me. And I'm not talking about secular wise. I'm talking about in the church. But all of that education that we get, all the education that we, we soak in on a regular basis, it has to lead you somewhere. It has to be used. And the education that you get is not so much just so you can exegete the, the Bible verse, so you can understand what the scriptures are saying over and over again. It's, it's ultimately all scripture leads to Christ. So the education that you get should be in a sense where you are leading others to Christ. If I can use the terminology, and this might be out of date, but some of y'all are diesel. And diesel back in my day was just a street term to saying, listen, you got it going on. You all that. You're built up. You're ready for action. So since you diesel, 
Go get it on. Step out on faith. Share the gospel. Use that education. And you know what? Every now and then when I'm engaged with someone in conversation, sometimes I guess what? I get asked a question I don't know the answer to. And guess what? It's all right. It's all right that we don't know the answer to every question that comes down the pike. Just tell them, give me a minute. Give me your phone number. I'm going to go research it, and I'm going to come hit you back. So we don't have to be intimidated, folks, because we don't know it all. But when you know Christ, you know it all. <laughs> well, you know it all when you know Christ. Think about it. That one just popped into my head. At the end of the day, we can care less about the number of degrees you got. We can care less about the occupation you hold. Care less about the cars we drive. Care less about the zip codes we live in. But the question is, do you know Jesus? If the answer is no, then you're going to the first hot place. So a hot church, if a policy is the example of a hot church, then let me just try to narrow this down now. Guess what? He was educated correctly. He took his knowledge to share the gospel. That's a hot church. Are you with me on that? No, you know, let me ask it a little differently. Who's not with me on that? It's important. It's very important that you understand that. That the education that you receive, the, the gift of the gospel that you have, is supposed to be imparted to others because that's what a hot church does. Why should the church be hot? Why should the church be hot in sharing the good news of God's love? Because it's all about Jesus. What name is given under heaven where man must be saved? Jesus. Who can wash away my sins? Jesus. Who can make me whole again? Jesus. It's all about Jesus. But let me give you a couple other reasons why this should be a hot church. Because lukewarm Christianity makes God sick. Hard work and patience, but, for, but forsaking your first love. Let me just give that to you again. Hard work and patience, which is all good Christian-y stuff. But if you're doing that for the sake of doing it and not having your first love, which is Jesus Christ in the midst of it, guess what? That's lukewarm Christianity. Truth to the, to, to the faith, but compromising your Christian walk, that's lukewarm Christianity. Love, service, faith, but living immorally, that's lukewarm Christianity. Effective, but superficial, that's lukewarm Christianity. You need to repent and be faithful to God. Another one here that uh, is so dear to me, his time is going by so fast. I can't believe time is going by so fast. When I was a kid, I played uh, football in the cemetery. Anybody else play football in the cemetery other than me? I'm the only one? <laughs> Shows I got a problem, right? I lived across the street from a cemetery, and to the left of the cemetery were all the tombstones and so forth. But the area that we played football on, there was no tombstones, it was just all green grass. And this was in my teenage years. Fast forward to now, that whole area is filled with tombstones. You couldn't throw a football in there if you tried. People die every day. Time is running out. I love talking to young people because I love to get them engaged and saying, listen, I know you're enjoying yourself now, but time is running out. 
Time is running out. Matthew 9, 37 says this, the harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. We need to be a hot church. We need to really need to be a hot church. So I talked about the what, the why. Now I'm going to tell you about the how. You ready for this one? How to turn up your love life and make it high. Uh oh, uh oh. Some of them get your pens out. The Bible tells us that we need to, to love others. I think I've shared that in the scriptures that we've read. So the love that I'm talking about is the love for others. How do you make it hot? By sharing the gospel. And you know what? We need to practice sharing the gospel. Sometimes I get compliments, Roger, you do it, uh, you do it so easily, uh, so whatever. I'm like, listen, trust me, I'm nervous, I mess up, I don't say what I think I ought to say, but I practice at it, I practice at it. If there's any surgeon or any teacher or even what you do for a living, I want to submit to you that you're better now than you were when you first started. Why? Because you practice. In the NFL, they call it taking reps. We need to take as many reps as we can in sharing the gospel. That means you just do it over and over and over again. Not with just, just for the sake of doing it, knowing that, listen, we need to be concerned of the soul of others. Are you concerned about the soul of others? Does anyone care the fact that someone's going to die and we don't know if they know Jesus Christ? It should be a concern, saints. And let me say this before I forget it. Whatever your occupation is, that's probably what you do on a regular basis. I want you to knock that down to number two. Your number one job this day going forward is to be a missionary. That's what God has called us to be. Missionaries are not just those who go across seas and so forth. We're all missionaries, saints. We are all missionaries. We are the ones God is using. Glory be to God. He's using us to what? To share and impart the gospel. So we're all missionaries. So practice. Start on your block, wherever you live. Start there. there I guarantee you there are people out there that are suffering. You just don't know it. The suburbs look cute, but they got drama like any other place. Look for opportunities to share the gospel. Look for them. They're there. Quick story. My wife tells me never talk, don't talk about basketball examples anymore, but man, that's what I enjoy. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, I don't know, what do you enjoy? I know Sister Marsha, I know you do the scrapbooking, so you enjoy it, right? You enjoy it, and then you use it to be able to share the gospel. That's what I'm talking about. You know, whatever you use, whatever, whatever is you, use it to share the gospel. Whatever you like to do, because you want to do it anyway, right? You're going to do whatever you enjoy anyway, right? Now, I must be in the wrong church here. Come on now. You know you like to chill, you like to relax, you like to do you. But can you use, can you do you while sharing the gospel? Can you use what God has blessed you to desire, to like to do, and use it to impart the gospel? Myself, uh, Ezra, and uh, Ashmere, and Brent, we went to go play some basketball. So they text me, like, oh, head, you want to play some basketball today? It's like, sure, all right, let's go. 
So we went to go play basketball. I won the first game, praise the Lord, right? And we played the next game. And while we're playing the game, a young man walks up and he looks at what's going on. And I'm talking junk to Brent and Ashmere. And the young man starts to smile. He lives in the community that we were in. And I said, guess what? You can get some too. Go get a friend and come on back. They go get a friend. He come back. We play the game. And I was just there to have fun. I, actually, I wanted just to hurry up, get the game over with, to beat the rain. But something said to me, make a deal with them. Now, I'm not a betting man. I don't bet, okay? I don't bet, <laughs> right? But this was the deal. If we win, you give me five minutes of your time. If we lose, we buy you the Gatorade. They were ahead five to zero. Then I had to turn it on. <laughs> right? Eventually, the game was eight to eight. Game went to nine. And lo and behold, we missed a shot. It was their ball. They got the ball. The young man, I can remember the play too. The young man floated over to the right. The one kid darted towards the, the hoop. I'm not going to say who missed the ball. But I'm gonna say, I'm, I ain't going to put him on blast. But my teammate missed the ball. They got the ball, laid it up. Nine to eight. They won. And I said, a deal's a deal. I'll be right back with your Gatorade. The young man said, hold on, before you go, if you did win, what would you have said to us? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was fit to be tired. All I wanted to tell you was that God loves you. And he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for your sins. That's all I wanted to say to you. And they were like, okay. I walked. I got the Gatorade. Came back across. I said, listen, you guys won. Pick the flavors you want. Right? They took the flavors they wanted. And I just said, by the way, would you like to go to heaven one day? All three of them said yes. I said, let's pray. Two of them said the prayer. I'm hoping... They meant that prayer, but God knows. God knows. First John chapter four, verse 17 says this. We reflect God's loving character in our lives. We're all missionaries, folks. I'm just gonna wrap up. We're all missionaries. You know what? Turn to 1 John 4, 17. I'm going to turn there with you. 1 John 4, 17. And I like the way that this version puts it. And it says, God's, God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect more complete, if you will. So we will not be afraid of the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. The part that stands out for me is that we live like Jesus here in this world. Jesus did not come to, to be served. He came to serve. He came to be the sacrifice that we all need in order to get from here to there. If Jesus was willing to do that for the likes of us, shouldn't we be willing to do that for the likes of others? That's what a hot church is all about. So there's two hot places. One is hell, and the other should be us, the church. But if you're here this, this uh, afternoon, in Revelations it talks about the word cold, and I want to submit to you that if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you're cold. If you've never surrendered your life to God, you're cold. And guess what? Cold people will, meet, will, will be made hot in hell. It doesn't have to be that way for you saints. It doesn't have to be that way. 
Bow with me, please, and just pray with me. I hope this message was clear. That God wants you.